Let's do this. Hello everyone, my name is Rebecca and welcome back to another episode of TJLC Explained. Today I'm going to be discussing one of Stacey's favorite episodes, A Scandal in Belgravia. I know a lot of you have been looking forward to this one and I've put a lot of extra effort in into giving this one a very thorough analysis, so buckle in. I know A Scandal in Belgravia worries a lot of people because they believe it's a romance between Sherlock and Irene. It absolutely isn't, but I know that idea is really insidious, so I have to do a bit of extra setting up before I get into my discussion of the episode. So the first thing I need to address is that it isn't true truly accurate to call this episode an adaptation of a scandal in Bohemia. Even if it were, that wouldn't matter too much because Sherlock Holmes never gives any indication of being attracted to Irene Adler, and Irene Adler is married to another man anyway. But while the episode may take a few plot points and its title from a scandal in Bohemia, the majority of the plot and the film's tone clearly take heavy inspiration from the 1970 film The Private Life of Sherlock Holmes. They're basically the exact same story. You may remember me mentioning that T-Plot is the closest we've come to having an openly gay Holmes in film, and that Billy Wilder, the director of the film regrets not going further. I should have been more daring with the private life of Sherlock Holmes, but unfortunately the son of Conan Doyle was there. I wanted to make Holmes a homosexual. That's why he's on dope. This film is a favorite both of Mark Gatiss, who called it the film that changed his life, and Stephen Moffat, who wrote this episode. The wonderful thing is that not only does Stephen Moffat clearly take heavy inspiration from the gayest Holmes film to ever exist, he actually improves it. He takes away Watson's homophobia, and he changes the ending so that Sherlock can save the woman and move on with his life, unlike Holmes in the film, who fails and has to live with his regrets. And because this episode is part of a larger series, they will be able to do what Billy Wilder couldn't, show a canon relationship between Sherlock and John. The events that unfold here are just one small part of their story. Throughout the episode, I'll be comparing A Scandal in Belgravia to The Private Life of Sherlock Holmes, so you can see for yourself just how much that film influenced Moffat's writing, and so you can understand the end of the episode a bit better. Another Another very important thing to understand is that Irene Adler is a mirror for Sherlock. It's where you really see the mirror. The two of them are here. I'll be explaining specifically how we know this throughout the episode, but you need to know that these two characters mirror each other going in. Not only that, the biggest difference between the two is the amount of power they have. Fittingly, for an episode featuring a dominatrix, the entire thing is a power play. Irene starts off with all the power and ends up powerless, while Sherlock starts the episode helpless and ends it with the ability to help Irene. When that arc completes itself, the story resolves, and so the events of the episode are self-contained. Apart from that, the motivations of these two characters are the same. If Sherlock is preparing for an interesting challenge, Challenge, so is Irene. If Irene is afraid, so is Sherlock. Which leads me to my final point leading into the episode. All of Irene's actions ultimately come from a place of fear. How do I know this? Well, apart from Irene constantly talking about her need for protection, Laura Pulver, the actress who plays Irene, says so herself in the episode commentary. And the fact that all of her actions are completely from a place of fear and protection <laughs> and mm. to kind of build mm. that stronger mask every layer. And accordingly, Sherlock's actions are also coming from a place of fear. Like I said at the end of the episode on The Great Game, Moriarty's threat to burn out Sherlock's heart was extremely effective. I think what's fascinating over the series as well is how he's pushed out onto his own as an, as, as, as an individual, how he has to separate himself from the world that's around him, that he's allowed to help him and be close to him. And it is, it is his sort of growing humanization that actually makes him incredibly vulnerable to Moriarty in the end, so he has to... He has to sort of sacrifice that yeah. and become a bit of a lone warrior, which I, which I, I think is rather wonderful. This will explain a lot of both of their actions. With all of that established, I can get into the episode. Just remember that both Sherlock and Irene are gay, and neither of them are at any point attracted to each other. If you think they are, you're letting heteronormativity trick you. Do your best to push that aside going in, and I'll do my best to make keeping that gone an easy task. So we pick up immediately where we left off in the pool, with Sherlock and John agreeing to die together with a single glance. The brief recap is sure to remind us about Moriarty's line about loving the game they're playing. I have loved this, this little game of ours. That's relevant. The game continues in this episode. Although Irene will be the one directly playing the game with Sherlock, Moriarty is the one pulling the strings. The recap is also careful to remind us of Moriarty's threat to Sherlock, since it will play a big role in the episode. If you don't stop prying, I'll burn you. I'll burn the heart out of you. Moriarty's game is all an attempt to burn Sherlock's heart, and to further isolate him from the people around him. The cliffhanger resolves in a way that seems silly at first. Moriarty's phone goes off, interrupting the deadly standoff.
you mind if I get that? The thing is, though, that if something seems ridiculous at first on this show, it's probably actually very important. Take the introduction of Jim Moriarty as a flamboyant gay man, for example. I explained the significance of that in the Great Game video. It wasn't just a cheap gay joke. It's the same with this. Not only is it foreshadowing the climax of this series, but it's also setting up that power dynamic arc I was talking about just a few minutes ago. Irene Adler just unknowingly saved Sherlock's life. This is where she is at her most powerful, and in order for the imbalance that this causes between the two characters to be resolved, Sherlock will have to end up saving Irene. You see where I'm going with this. Another thing that's established in the scene is that Irene knows that she cannot count on Moriarty to protect her. She knows she's only safe as long as she's useful to him. Say that again! Say that again, and know that if you're lying to me, I will find you, and I will skin you. So if you have what you say you have, I will make you rich. If you don't, I'll make you into shoes. So Irene isn't going to put all of her faith in Moriarty. She'll be working on other backup plans for her protection. Moriarty leaves, and Sherlock and John are left questioning why they're still alive. As Sherlock wonders who changed Moriarty's mind, we get our first glimpse of Irene. The question is, who? Well now, have you been wicked, your highness? Yes, Miss Adler. Not only does her introduction closely match Sherlock's, We'll start with the writing crop. But there's the very important matter of her client. They could have easily made her client a man, and for many writers that would have been the default. And yet her client is a woman. They're setting her up as a lesbian long before she tells us that herself. And since she parallels Sherlock, they're reinforcing his sexuality as well. They're both gay. A few months later, life goes on. Quite literally. I'm going to be talking about the blog entries that appear on screen because I believe they wouldn't be showing them to us unless they were important. For the first entry, when Sherlock asks what John is writing about, he says, us, which is already pretty sad. When Sherlock says that John is probably writing about him, John doesn't pause until after he writes Sherlock's name. What are you typing? Blog. About? Us. You mean me. Why? <clears throat> well, you're typing a lot. Their lives continue on as normal, with John thinking he's made his feelings clear and finding an outlet in his blog, and Sherlock thinking that the blog is deceptively romantic and being bitter about it like in the last episode. Now we get to some of the clients. A few of them are actually hinting at the main case of the episode, an idea taken from the private life of Sherlock Holmes, where the crew members of the SS Jonas show up much earlier in the film in the background. Look at this. An urgent appeal to find some missing midgets. The circus owner offers me five pounds for my services. That's not even a pound a midget. So obviously he's a stingy blighter and the little chap simply ran off to join another circus. She's not my real aunt. She's been replaced. I know she has. I know human ash. Leave. They wouldn't let her see Granddad when he was dead. Is that because he's gone to heaven? There's a plane crash in Dusseldorf yesterday. Everyone dead. Suspected terrorist bomb. We do watch the news. He said boring and turned over. Here's his passport stamped in Berlin Airport. So this man should have died in a plane crash in Germany yesterday, but instead he's in a car boot in Southwark. Lucky escape. There's also the case of the Geek Interpreter, which is a huge nod from the creators to the fans. We have this website. It explains the true meaning of comic books, because people miss a lot of the themes. Uh, but then all the comic books start coming true. Oh, interesting. Even back then, people were worried that the show was queerbaiting. And in the episode that would put fans' faith to the test, Stephen included hints that we could trust them. If you go on John's blog, you can read about how Chris and his friends had a website where they talked about comic books, and how, according to Chris and his friends, there were all these hidden messages in the stories. Yeah. Not only that, but the theories coming true ended up being the writers trying to deceive Chris to get more publicity. They were preying on his enthusiasm to make a profit. Not only did this case capture Sherlock's attention, but he helped Chris expose the writers for their deception and got the comic cancelled. That's sending a pretty strong message. Then there's this. Do people actually read your blog? Where do you think our clients come from? I have a website. In which you enumerate 240 different types of tobacco ash. Nobody's reading your website. Oh, how can you stand this? Why don't you let me hear the room out? Please, Mrs. Hudson, he's working on a definitive study of tobacco ash. Oh, I'm sure there's a crying need for that. So far, he has classified 140 different kinds of ashes. Hmm. Look at that. 1,895. Sorry, what? I reset that counter last night. This blog has had nearly 2,000 hits in the last eight hours. This is your living, Sherlock. Not 240 different types of tobacco ash. 243. 
I see you 1895 reference, but this is also notable because in The Private Life of Sherlock Holmes, John's writing being popular is a somewhat important plot point. In both versions, it has an impact on Sherlock's persona. Oh, come now, Watson, you must admit you have a tendency to over-romanticize. You've taken my simple exercises in logic and embellished them, embroidered them, exaggerated them. I deny them. the accusation. You have described me as six foot four, whereas I am barely six foot one. A bit of poetic life. You've saddled me with this improbable costume, which the public now expects me to wear. This is not my doing. Blame it on the illustrator. There's a lot of press outside, guys. Well, they won't be interested in us. Yeah, that was before you were an internet phenomenon. A couple of them specifically wanted photographs of you two. For God's sake. John, mm. cover your face and walk fast. Still, it's good for the public image. Big case like this. Private detective, the last thing I need is a public image. <laughs> I'll be talking a lot more about what the deerstalker represents next week, but it's already superficially tied to heterosexuality when Irene caresses the photograph of Sherlock wearing it. But she's not doing this for romantic reasons. She's ready to start the game, and she tells Moriarty as much. No. I think it's time, don't you? It's time because Sherlock is now visible enough that he can be publicly disgraced, which you'll remember if you've seen the Reichenbach fall is part of Moriarty's plan to bring Sherlock down. Then Sherlock and John are brought the backfiring car case. Tell us from the start, don't be boring. Sherlock admits to John, when John is complaining about being sent to investigate a crime via Skype, that he's constantly talking to John even when he's not there. When did we agree that? We agreed it yesterday. Stop. Go, sir. I wasn't even at home yesterday. I was in Dublin. It's only my fault you weren't listening. Which is a pretty big contrast to, oh, I don't know, constantly ignoring someone every time they try to text you, which is the way he treats Irene. That doesn't seem like love. He also pretends that he doesn't know when John is away, but we know from future episodes that that's an act. Do you just carry on talking when I'm away? I don't know. How often are you away? Also, Sherlock's gestures are particularly sassy in this scene, a nice lead-in for an episode that a lot of people are going to mistakenly think is a straight romance. I oh, forget him, he's an idiot. Don't worry, this is just stupid. John and Sherlock being summoned in the middle of a case to meet with Mycroft is another plot point taken from the private life of Sherlock Holmes. Mr. Holmes, this letter. What about it? It is addressed to you. To me? That's impossible. We sent it ourselves. Nevertheless, my dear Sherlock, I expect you and Dr. Watson to join me at the club immediately upon receipt of this note. According to my calculations, that should be at 11.40 a.m. Your brother, Mycroft. His room's through the back. Get in some clothes. Who the hell are you? Sorry, Mr. Holmes. Sherlock? You're coming with us. What's happening? I've, I've lost him. I don't know what... Dr. Watson? Yeah, it's for you. Okay, thanks. Uh, no, sir. The helicopter. I really love this next scene, and I'm not the only one. This is my favourite scene in the entire oh. episode, this, <laughs> this whole location and this setup. That's really interesting coming from the actress who plays Irene. This scene really shows the connection between John and Sherlock, both the sexual tension and just the genuine fun they have being together. For sexual tension, John certainly knows right where to look. You wearing any pants? No. Okay. And then they start giggling like children. <laughs> Buckingham Palace. Right. <clears throat> uh -huh. oh, oh, I'm seriously fighting an impulse to steal an ashtray. <laughs> <clears throat> what are we doing here? Sherlock, look, seriously, what? I don't know. Here to see the Queen? Oh, apparently, yes. <laughs> <clears throat> so not just a cheap oh, gay joke. No, Super villain. No, no. <laughs> no one in this episode is straight. Not only that. Here to see the Queen? And this is my brother Sherlock, ma'am. Ah, yes. Sherlock Holmes. We have been following your exploits with great interest. Thank you, ma'am. And Sherlock's client is actually the Queen. Let's get in some more cheap lash references while we're at it. My employer is a tremendous fan of your blog. Your employer? I particularly enjoyed the one about the aluminium crutch. Kim. Madame is a great admirer of yours. She has read every story. Her favorite is 
big dog from Vascaville. Madame says you are shorter than she thought. Oh, I didn't mean to be. And Mr. Holmes the Younger. You look taller in your photographs. Take the precaution of a good coat and a short friend. You thought I was exaggerating when I said in the intro that this episode is literally private life. I was not. In this version, Sherlock appears taller because he has his coat, which is his armor, and because John idolizes him so much. He's looking up to him. Also, the aluminium crutch is mentioned not once but twice on the show, and that blog entry is a transcription of voice messages Sherlock left John when he was on a date, while claiming that he didn't have the time to explain it to Scotland Yard. That is one of the saddest, gayest things I've ever heard. And they draw attention to it twice. Sherlock starts throwing a tantrum because Mycroft won't tell him who his employer is, and almost exposes himself in front of everyone, John included. What I wouldn't give for a version of this scene with John's face in focus. Good morning. This is a matter of national importance. Grow up. Get off my sheet. Or what? Oh, I'll just walk away. I'll let you. Boys, please, not here. Who is my client? Take a look at where you're standing and make a deduction. You are to be engaged by the highest in the land. Now, for God's sake, Put your clothes on. We get a small confirmation in this scene that when Mycroft kidnapped John in the first episode, he was trying to see if he could be trusted. I'd be happy to pay you a meaningful sum of money on a regular basis to ease your way. Why? Because you're not a wealthy man. In exchange for what? Information. No. I haven't mentioned a figure. Don't bother. This is a matter of the highest security and therefore of trust. You don't trust your own secret service? Naturally not. They all spy on people for money. <laughs> Remember, these two episodes were written by the same person. Here, Irene is properly introduced. I want you to listen very carefully to the phrasing of this sentence. She's been at the center of two political scandals in the last year and recently ended the marriage of a prominent novelist by having an affair with both participants separately. Did you just assume that the participants were a man and a woman? Why? The phrase very deliberately avoided mentioning genders. They could both be women for all you know, and they probably are considering what we know about Irene's sexuality. Free your mind from heteronormativity, my friends. It does wonders. They cleverly chose the woman as Irene's professional title, meaning that Sherlock referring to her as that is rather impersonal, less of an intimate thing and more of a show of respect. And what is her profession? Irene Adler, professionally known as the woman. Professionally? There are many names for what she does. She prefers dominatrix. Now, why would they choose to make her a dominatrix rather than a spy like in t -plush? Not the offhand to be sexy answer. Really think about it. Consider that it was to make the audience think of power dynamics and therefore notice the exchange of power that takes place over the episode, signifying that it's a complete story arc by itself. That makes a lot more sense than Moffat trying to work out a fetish. And this interpretation takes the show a lot more seriously. Mycroft implying that Sherlock doesn't know anything about sex is another subtle nod to private life. What a vivid imagination my brother has. At the age of five, by carefully observing a neighbor's house, he deduced that babies were brought not by the stork, but by the midwife uh, in her satchel. <laughs> as good an explanation as any. <laughs> Don't be alarmed. It's to do with sex. Sex doesn't alarm me. <laughs> How would you know? Sherlock's inexperience is actually a key plot point in the episode. It's how both Irene and Moriarty are approaching Sherlock. They call him the Virgin. Sherlock and Irene directly mirror each other here when they're both looking at photos of each other. Remember what I said about shared motivations. Sherlock is preparing for a new challenge, and so is Irene. She provides, shall we say, recreational scolding for those who enjoy that sort of thing and are prepared to pay for it. These are all from her website. Also, if you'd like to go back and pause on the pictures of her website, you'll notice that there's no mention of having sex. Just bondage, whipping, and revealing secrets. You can't say she doesn't warn people. Sherlock eventually works out the client's identity, and he's clearly amused to realize that it was the princess. I can tell you it's a young person. A young female person. 
the show low-key just implied that Kate Middleton is a queer woman into BDSM, and people still think this show is worried about offending people. Sherlock spells out what the episode is about, in case you don't already believe me on the power play theory. She got in touch, she informed us that the photographs existed, she indicated that she had no intention to use them to extort either money or favor. Oh, a power play. A power play with the most powerful family in Britain. Now that is a dominatrix. Oh, this is getting rather fun, isn't it, Sherlock? He's got the wrong family, though. Cam will later state that, for those in the know, Mycroft Holmes is the most powerful man in Britain. Irene's game is with the Holmes brothers. In the car, it's revealed that Sherlock stole the ashtray for John. Okay, the smoking. How did you know? The evidence is right under your nose, John, as ever you see but do not observe. Is that what? An ashtray. <laughs> <laughs> ash keeps cropping up in this episode, so remember how in the past I've said that cigarettes are phallic imagery? Well, in that case, ash is the residue left behind from a completed cigarette. Earlier, John wanted an ashtray, a place to put the residue, and Sherlock gave him one. Why does this show get worse every time I watch it? If you still don't believe that Irene is gay, in the scene where she's going through her closet, she literally has a gay halo. She's a lesbian. In the next scene, Sherlock and Irene again mirror each other when both are getting ready with the help of their partners. Kate, Irene's assistant, is a clear analog for John. Irene and Sherlock are literally framed in mirrors. No, works for me. Everything works on you. So, what's the plan? You know her address? We'll just ring her doorbell. Exactly. Just here, please. I didn't even change your clothes. Then it's time to add a splash of color. When Sherlock asks John to punch him, there's a cut to Kate caressing Irene's face in a mirror with a rainbow overlaying it. We here? Uh, two streets away, but this will do. For what? Punch me in the face. Shay? Blood. Also this next line. Punch you. Yes, punch me in the face, didn't you hear me? I always hear punch me in the face when you're speaking, but it's usually subtext. Not only is John constantly subconsciously hearing Sherlock asking him to touch him, but this scene is again contrasted with Kate gently touching Irene's mouth. But it's usually subtext. Oh, for God's sakes. Oh. Oh. Thank you. That was... That was... Thank you. And John just can't stop touching Sherlock once he's started. He has to get out that frustration somehow. Okay. I think we're done now, John. You want to remember, sir, I was a soldier. I killed people. You were a doctor. I had bad days. He reminds Sherlock that he was a soldier and not just a doctor, which many people believe parallels his attraction to men and his attraction to women, respectively. Sherlock only thinks the latter is relevant because he doesn't yet realize how John feels about him. For their first meeting, Sherlock comes to Irene's home faking tears to gain sympathy. This will be important towards the end of the episode when everything starts coming full circle. Please, could you help me? I can find the police if you want. Thank you, thank you. Could you please? Uh, would, you, would you mind if I just waited here just until they come? Thank you, thank you so much. And then he gets his first glimpse of Irene. Hello, sorry to hear that you've been hurt. I don't think Kate caught your name. I'm so sorry. I, I'm. He only looks at her face the entire time and does a little sassy affronted head tilt when she defrocks him. Oh, it's always hard to remember an alias when you've had a fright, isn't it? Well, there now. We're both defrocked. Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Miss Adler, I presume. Irene makes a comment that will be coming back in a future episode. Oh, look at those cheekbones. I could cut myself slapping that face. Would you like me to try? This is when John comes in and his jealousy immediately starts flaring up. I've missed something, haven't I? Please, sit down. Oh, if you'd like some tea, I can call the maid. I had some at the palace. I know. Clearly. I had a tea too at the palace, if anyone's interested. We get the first direct juxtaposition to the way Sherlock views Irene and the way he views John. He can't understand Irene, but he reads John perfectly. Also, there are more rainbow lights, and the camera focuses in on particular features of John, like his chest, his lips, and his eyes, while the camera remains much more steady on Irene. And remember, this is Sherlock's gaze.
then there's Irene's line about disguise. Do you know the big problem with a disguise, Mr. Holmes? However hard you try, it's always a self-portrait. She's right, although not in the way she intends. Sherlock is dressed like a celibate priest in this scene while Irene is fully naked, just to drive home the fact that she's him with sexual experience and no moral center. Irene continues to be incredibly astute, much to John's chagrin. Somebody loves you. Well, if I had to punch that face, I'd avoid your nose and teeth too. This is where John starts getting very uncomfortable. <laughs> Could you put something on, please? Uh, anything at all, a uh, napkin. Why? Uh, are you feeling exposed? I don't think John knows where to look. No, I think he knows exactly where. Yes, he does. Irene outright admits that her plan isn't working on Sherlock, though. I'm not sure about you. I want to look at naked women. I borrow John's laptop. You do borrow my laptop. I confiscate it. So, Sherlock trying to stop John from watching straight porn is canon now. Sherlock just stated again that he's not interested in women. And surprise, surprise, a woman in Sherlock's clothes is yet another t flash reference. Now tell me, I need to know. Where am I? Those are just gonna keep happening. Now, Irene's job is all about knowing what people like. That story's not been on the news yet. How do you know about it? I know one of the policemen. Well, I know what he likes. That's very important because it means she knows how to manipulate people. John wasn't flirting with Irene when she was naked, but now that she's wearing Sherlock's coat, he starts going at it. And this is the only time that Sherlock gets flustered, when John starts flirting with someone else in front of him. They're both so obvious. Oh. And you like the policeman? I like detective stories and detectives. Brainy's the new sexy. This is a guy. Both Irene and John are startled at this, both mistakenly thinking that he's flustered over her saying that Brainy is the new sexy. Why would Irene be shocked if she didn't secretly suspect that Sherlock isn't attracted to her? Uh, the position of the car relative to the hiker at the time of the backfire, and the fact that the death blow was to the back of the head, that's all you need to know. Sherlock manipulates Irene into letting him know where the photographs are, and Sherlock and John share a little glance when they put their plan into motion. You don't think it was murder? I know it wasn't. How? The same way that I know the victim was an excellent sportsman, recently returned from foreign travel, and the photographs I'm looking for are in this room. Okay, but how? So they are in this room. Thank you. John, man the door, let no one in. Irene is visibly shaken now that she's no longer in perfect control of the situation, and nervously glances around the room, no longer caring about making an impression on Sherlock. She just doesn't want to lose her protection. Two men alone in the countryside, several yards apart, and one car. Oh, I, I thought you were looking for the photos now. No, no, looking takes ages. I'm just going to find them. You might have also noticed that Sherlock was looking in a mirror while he was speaking. Both Irene and Sherlock are surprisingly vulnerable when their masks slip away. Irene conceals herself using her body and her sexuality, while Sherlock hides behind his mind and his work. When Sherlock gets a semblance of control, he reverts to that, talking about the case, his work. And it's clear he isn't impressed by Irene. Any moment now, something's going to happen. What? The hack is going to die. No, that's the result. What's going to happen? I don't understand. Oh, I'll try to. Why? Because you cater to the whims of the pathetic and take your clothes off to make an impression. Stop boring me and think. It's the new sexy. She looks more vulnerable here than she normally does. She's still afraid. This will come back again later when it looks like Sherlock has lost and is likewise dejected. John sets their plan into motion, starting a fire to set off the smoke alarm and making Irene look towards her phone. Noises can tell you everything. For instance... Thank you. Let's all just pause for a moment to appreciate the fact that Irene's phone, which is everything she cares about, her literal heart, is concealed behind a mirror. And it's under several layers of protection. This is about both of them. Sherlock explains his plan. On hearing a smoke alarm, a mother would look towards her child. Amazing how fire exposes our priorities. This is the episode after the burn the heart out of you threat, and it's about to be even more direct. The phone is just as much Sherlock's heart as it is Irene's. And again, while Sherlock's protection is his work, Irene's is her body, which is further emphasized when she throws his order to think right back at him, and the solution is her measurements. Mm. Should always use gloves with these things, you know? Heaviest oil deposit's always on the first key used. That's quite clearly a three, but after that sequence, it's almost impossible to read. Say for the mate that it's a six-digit code. Can't be a birthday, no disrespect, but clearly you were born in the 80s. Eight's barely used, so... I tell you the code right now. You know what? I already have. 
back to fire exposing our priorities. American agents break in and hold everyone at gunpoint, and it's only when they threaten to kill John that Sherlock is able to push himself to figure it out. For God's sake, she's the one who knows the code. Ask her. Yes, sir. She also knows the code that automatically calls the police and sets off the burglar alarm. I've learned not to trust this one. Mr. Holmes doesn't... Shut up. One more word out of you. Just one. And I will decorate that wall with the insides of your head. That, for me, will not be hardship. Mr. Archer, at the count of three, shoot Dr. Watson. What? I don't know the code. One. I don't know the code. Two. She didn't tell me. I don't know it! I'm prepared to believe you any second now. Three. No, stop! Amazing how fire exposes our priorities. Even with that extreme motivation, it's only with another hint from Irene that he's able to connect it to her measurements. No. Thank you, Mr. Holmes. Open it, please. Irene's phone is not only hidden behind a mirror and kept in a key code protected safe, it's also booby trapped. She's all about protection and backup plans in case something goes wrong. And again, everything about Irene's phone also applies to Sherlock's heart. It's under very heavy guards so that he doesn't get hurt. Irene's booby trap goes off and they incapacitate the attackers. Vatican cameos. Not at all. Irene comments on Sherlock correctly guessing the code and tells him she's flattered. And Sherlock very pointedly tells her not to be. And John gets jealous. Thank you. You were very observant. Observant? And flattered. Don't be. Flattered. How much more clear would you like it to be? Once Sherlock has Irene's phone, he discovers one last wall of protection. Irene certainly is thorough. Check the rest of the house, see how they got in. Well, that's the knighthood in the bag. Ah, oh, and that's mine. I'm going to address the passcode now, rather than waiting till the end of the episode. Sherlock eventually discovers that the password is set to S-H-E-R to complete the phrase, I am Sherlocked. He assumes this is because she's in love with him, because he has some evidence that points in that direction. But she's already been given just as much gay coding as Sherlock, and she will later directly state that she's gay. And as many people have accusingly asked, why would Moffat include a lesbian only to have her fall in love with a man? I will repeat once again, that she doesn't. So why this passcode then? Sherlock will later say that she got carried away with the game. And like Irene with the disguise as a self-portrait line, which comes up again in that conversation, he's right, but not for the reason he thinks. She was caught up in the game, but not because she was in love with him. It's Irene's job to know what people like, and it's obvious that what Sherlock likes isn't her. And we've already seen that Irene doesn't care about impressing Sherlock as much as she cares about her protection. That's what matters most. She's only doing all of this because Moriarty promised her something even better if she successfully takes down the Holmes brothers. Part of that is to give Sherlock a puzzle he could never solve. And she realizes that what he's least likely to suspect is that he himself is the key to her whole scheme. Just like with Moriarty in the pool, Sherlock always assumes that there's something bigger in the works when really it's just all for his benefit. So she gets carried away by that idea. By the fact that it's something so obvious that Sherlock would never work it out. So she sets her password to play on Sherlock's name. The alternative is that she falls madly in love with him after looking at his picture a few times, which is frankly ridiculous. It makes much more sense that she has an ulterior motive. This also has a greater impact on the story. It means the entire time the solution to the puzzle Sherlock is trying to solve is himself. If we go back to looking at the phone as also representing Sherlock's heart, the only thing keeping Sherlock from opening up to others, and to John specifically, is himself and his fears about losing his safety and John's if he were to make his feelings known. That's why the passcode is Sherlocked. Sherlock tries to take the phone and Irene emphasizes that she isn't interested in selling, that she needs her phone for protection, and that her protection is her highest priority. Why would she need protection if she weren't afraid of something? All the photographs are on here, I presume. I have copies, of course. No, you don't. You'll have permanently disabled any kind of uplink or connection. Unless the contents of this phone are proven to be unique, you wouldn't be able to sell them. You said I'm selling. Well, why would they be interested? If it's on the phone, it's clearly not just photographs. That camera phone is my life, Mr. Holmes. I'd die before I let you take it. It's my protection. Sure. It was. Upstairs, Irene needs to get Sherlock alone. 
not so she can flirt with him, but so she can incapacitate him and get her phone back, which is again her biggest priority. Irene sends John away with an entreaty to check the back door. Lovely play on words. John looks to Sherlock before going ahead. There's a back door. Better check it, Dr. Watson. Sure. With the drugs in her hand, Irene caresses Sherlock to distract him from the oncoming assault, which is basically what she's doing this entire episode. Sherlock looks confused at the contact. You're very calm. Well, your booby trap did just kill a man. He would have killed me. It was self-defense in advance. <laughs> What is that? What? Irene drugs and assaults Sherlock to get her phone back. Not only does this show how desperate she is to remain safe, but there is nothing romantic or sexual about this. She drugs him with something that she admits might kill him and hits him repeatedly. That's a villainous thing to do. Give it to me. Now. Give it to me. No. Give it to me. Uh, no. Oh, goodness uh. sake. Drop it. My only guess for why people see this as romantic is that as soon as Irene gets her phone back, her flirty mask goes back up. That's how she exercises her control. Ah, thank you, dear. Now tell that sweet little posh thing the pictures are safe with me. And not for blackmail, just for insurance. Besides, I might want to see her again. Oh, no, 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 no. It's been a pleasure. Don't spoil it. This is how I want you to remember me. The woman who beat you. Good night, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Apart from Sherlock not yet having a souvenir of Irene, this is essentially where a scandal in Bohemia ends, with Sherlock being outplayed and Irene disappearing forever, meaning that the rest of the episode must take its inspiration from elsewhere like tea plosh, which it does. John comes upstairs to find Sherlock convulsing on the ground, which, again, is not a sexy image. Jesus, what are you doing? He'll sleep for a few hours. Make sure he doesn't choke on his own vomit. It makes for a very unattractive call. What's this? What have you given him? Irene is putting on an extra breathy voice, but it's not for Sherlock's benefit, who's so drugged out he can't notice, but for John. Irene already knows how John feels about Sherlock, and since Moriarty's goal, and by extension hers, is to burn out Sherlock's heart, she's going to use this opportunity to plant a seed that will drive a wedge between John and Sherlock. Not in terms of struggling to cooperate, like in season one, but by feeding into John's jealousy. He'll be fine. I've used it on loads of my friends. Sherlock, can you hear me? No, I was wrong about him. He didn't know where to look. So what? What are you talking about? The key code to my safe. W what was it? Shall I tell him? My measurements. The important thing to know about the drug deduction scene is that it isn't real, so Irene isn't actually as clever as Sherlock makes her out to be here. Sherlock feels outsmarted, and his drugged mind translates that into Irene solving the case and using the opportunity to further press her advances. He's not into it. An accomplished sportsman recently returned from foreign travel with a boomerang. You got that from one look? Definitely the new sexy. wakes up, his first thought isn't of Irene, it's of John. It always is. John? John! Sherlock is still heavily dosed with whatever Irene gave him, so he's pretty out of it. And John manhandles him back onto the bed so he can sleep. What are you... what? No, 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 no. Ah, oh, damn it! John subtly pats Sherlock before reassuring him that he's just outside the door in case Sherlock needs him, and shows that for now at least, he knows that Sherlock pretending not to need him is a total act. Ah, you'll be fine in the morning. Just sleep. Ah, uh, of course I'll be fine. I am fine. I'm absolutely fine. Yes, you're great. Now I'll be next door if you need me. Why would I need you? No reason at all. Before Sherlock can sleep, his phone goes off with the first of many texts that he'll receive from Irene. Ah! <sighs> Thank you. 
I've always seen the last shot here as highlighting the differences between the two marks on Sherlock's face. One was consensual and was explicitly given by someone who loves him. The other was an assault and didn't bother to avoid going near his mouth. <laughs> Now let's quickly summarize the events of the last few minutes. Irene appears to lose, then wins, and Sherlock helplessly listens to Irene's deductions while Irene tampers with his phone. We'll see the reverse of this play out at the end of the episode when the power dynamic has shifted in Sherlock's favor. The next scene starts with an establishing shot of Baker Street with more rainbow lights. When Mycroft mentions that the phone is in the hands of a fugitive sex worker, Sherlock reiterates that Irene doesn't want blackmail, she wants protection, but he doesn't know what for. Photographs are perfectly safe. In the hands of a fugitive sex worker. She's not interested in blackmail. She wants protection for some reason. Sherlock gets a text from Irene, and Mycroft definitely reads it over his shoulder and looks extremely confused at the message and the noise. Ah. What was that? Text. Well, what was that noise? Did you know there were other people after her too, Mycroft? before you sent John and I in there. This happens while Sherlock is talking about Mycroft deliberately sending them into danger, which Mycroft doesn't deny because it's true on multiple layers. CIA trained killers at an excellent guess. Yeah, thanks for that, Mycroft. It's a disgrace sending your little brother into danger like that. He'll later admit to driving Sherlock into Irene's path. The question is, at whose orders? Sherlock seems distant and annoyed about the insistent text from a woman who just drugged and beat him, and he doesn't respond to a single one, even though we know he always responds to John even when he's not there. Why does your phone make that noise? What noise? That noise. The one it just made. It's text to that. It means I've got a text. Hmm. Your texts don't usually make that noise. Well, somebody got a hold of the phone and apparently as a joke personalised their text alert noise. Hmm. So every time they text you... <sighs> It would seem so. Sherlock avoids talking to John about the text because that conversation would lead to him revealing that he's gay, which he still doesn't want to do because he believes that John wouldn't return his interests. He's very slow about this. So I'm wondering who could have got hold of your phone because it would have been in your coat, wouldn't it? I'll leave you to your deductions. I'm not stupid, you know. But do you get that idea? He pretends to be a machine the same way Irene hides behind her sexual behavior. Additionally, this scene is yet another one taken from Private Life, where Sherlock has to defy Mycroft's orders in order for the spy's plan to work. My dear Sherlock, there are certain affairs that do not come within the province of the private detective. They have to be dealt with on an altogether different level. In other words, you want me to stay within my limits? I do indeed. And speaking of limits, what exactly is Jonah Limited? Sherlock, when I said drop this case, it was not merely a suggestion, it was an order. By whose authority? By the authority of Her Majesty's government. I hope I have made myself clear. There's more. Much more. Something big's coming, isn't it? Irene Adler is no longer any concern of yours. From now on, you will stay out of this. Oh, will I? Yes, Sherlock. You will. Mycroft gets a call about a secret plan in the middle of this meeting, which is another allusion to T-Plosh. Uh, <clears throat> yes, Wiggins? An immediate answer is requested, sir. Oh, yes. Hmm. Tell them that the three boxes go to Glenahurik and the Red Runner goes to the castle. The three boxes to Glenahurik, the Red Runner to the castle. Very good, sir. Bond air is go. That's decided. Check with the Coventry lot. Talk later. Three months pass with Irene continuing to text Sherlock and John counting every text. The Christmas party in the next scene is a complete disaster. First of all, Sherlock is still very obviously jealous over John's girlfriends. Oh, no, thank you, Sarah. Uh, no, 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 he's, he's not good with names. No, 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 I can get this. No, Sarah was the doctor, and then there was the one with the spots, and then the one with the nose, and then who was after the boring teacher? Nobody. Jeanette! Ah, process of elimination. 
Uh. Oh, Sherlock. Not only does John not even try to defend his girlfriend, this makes it very clear that John has been going through women extremely quickly. Why would they bother to tell us that John's dating life is a complete mess if it wasn't important? And why would John be so persistent about finding a girlfriend if he weren't in desperate need of some kind of outlet? They still haven't managed to get past where they were in The Blind Banker in this regard. John leaves his girlfriend alone to talk to Sherlock about the blog he writes about him. John, mm. count on your blog. Smollett. Still says 1,895. No, Christmas is cancelled. It's still always 1895 they're stuck. Sherlock, clearly still uncomfortable from interacting with Jeanette, starts going off on deductions on other people, and it's obvious that John's relationship isn't the only one that's a mess. Thank you. I wasn't expecting to see you. I thought you were going to be in Dorset for Christmas. That's first thing in the morning, me and the wife. We're back together, it's all sorted. No, she's sleeping with a PE teacher. Basically, all the straight relationships are broken. Also, Sherlock was complaining to Molly about John being gone for Christmas. <laughs> and John, mm. I hear you're off to your sisters. Is that right? Yeah. Sherlock was complaining. Same. Then Sherlock gets to Molly. So you've got a new boyfriend, Molly, and you're serious about him. What? Sorry, what? In fact, you're seeing him this very night and giving him a gift. Now, it was clear in The Blind Banker, at least, that Sherlock was aware that Molly was attracted to him, just like he was then aware of John's attraction. Here, though, he completely overlooks himself as a romantic possibility because he thought she had moved on, just as he believes that John is no longer interested in him after he started dating women and he read John's blog. John's lack of interest is why he's being cynical about love and irritable in general. But after he realizes Molly's gift was for him, he feels remorse because he doesn't want to hurt people. He's not genuinely cool, he just got carried away by his own hurt feelings. You always say such horrible things. Every time. Always. Always. I am sorry. Forgive me. John is clearly surprised by the apology and the affectionate gesture. That's when Irene texts Sherlock. Merry Christmas, Molly Hooper. Uh, oh, no, that wasn't... No, I, I it didn't... was me. My God, really? What? My phone. And John, sitting right next to his girlfriend, reveals his obvious jealousy. 57? Sorry, what? 57 of those texts, the ones I've heard. Thrilling that you've been counting. Sherlock picks up the box and walks towards his room, and John, still sitting right next to his girlfriend, demands to know if Sherlock ever replies to her. W what's up, Sherlock? Said, excuse me. Do you have a reply? Garbage! <laughs> There's a quick shot of Molly drinking to deal with rejection, which will be relevant in a little bit. Sherlock mistakenly assumes that receiving the phone is a sign that Irene is dead, and informs Mycroft. I think you're going to find Irene Adler tonight. We already know where she is. As you were kind enough to point out, it hardly matters. No, I mean, you're going to find her dead. Maybe this is showing us that Sherlock would only have the courage to offer up his heart if he knew he was about to die. Sherlock shuts out John here the same Holmes does in T-Plosh when Ilsa really does die. You okay? Yes. Sherlock meets with Mycroft at the morgue to look at Irene's corpse. Molly is there, and her jealousy over Irene is meant to mirror John's. That's her, isn't it? Show me the rest of it. That's her. Thank you, Miss Hooper. Who is she? How did Sherlock recognize her from not her face? Sherlock walks out into the hall, and rainbows are placed above his head as a subtle cue about his feelings when he's offered the cigarette. Just the one. Why? Merry Christmas. This conversation between Sherlock and Mycroft is the fakest thing ever. Sherlock looks at the people crying in the other room and asks Mycroft if there's something wrong with him. Mycroft supplies him with the same advice he's been giving him since childhood. I look at them. They all care so much. Do you ever wonder if there's something wrong with us? All lives end. All hearts are broken. Caring is not an advantage. Sherlock. With that said, we know they both care. But Sherlock is specifically wondering if there's something wrong with him for not feeling heartbroken over Irene, because he never loved her and he wonders if he was supposed to, if he's broken because he doesn't feel attraction to her. I wonder if at this point Mycroft really thinks he's attracted to her or if he's just being overprotective as always. <sighs> This is Lotar. Well, 
You barely knew her. Huh. Chirac laughs off Mycroft's statement about him barely knowing Irene, because that's not why he's really upset, or why it's a danger night. He's been upset all day, and the unifying factor is John. Mycroft is also putting on an act about not caring. This is proven when he calls John and reveals they've been coordinating to make sure Sherlock is okay. He clearly cares very much. He's on his way. Have you found anything? No. Did he take the cigarette? Yes. Oh, shit. He's coming. Ten minutes. There's nothing in the bedroom. Well, it looks like he's clean. We've tried all the usual places. Are you sure tonight's a danger night? No, but then I never am. You have to stay with him, John. Oh, I've got plans. No. It's still Christmas night, and John had plans to take his girlfriend to meet his sister, and yet he instantly drops all of that for Sherlock. Jeanette clearly knows why. I am really sorry. You know, my friends are so wrong about you. Hmm? You're a great boyfriend. Okay, that's good. I mean, I always thought I was great. Now, Sherlock Holmes is a very lucky man. Ah, Jeanette, please. No, I mean it. It's heartwarming. He'll do anything for him. John doesn't deny that it's true. He just tries to say he'll do the same for her, even though he's shown that he won't. And he can't even tell your girlfriends apart. No, no, I'll do anything for you. When she puts on her coat, it's clear that he picked her because she is a Sherlock clone. Just tell me what it is I'm not doing. Tell me. Don't make me compete with Sherlock Holmes. It's not just Sherlock who can't tell John's girlfriends apart. I'll walk your dog for you. I've, I've said it now. I'll even walk I don't dog. have a dog. No, because that was the last one. Okay. Jesus! I'll call you. No! Okay. That really wasn't very good, was it? John is clearly a disaster, and his preoccupation with Irene texting Sherlock tells us why. He would much rather be with Sherlock than any of these women. Sherlock gets home and instantly knows they've been searching the flat for drugs. Oh, hi. You okay? I hope you didn't mess up my sock index this time. He shuts himself in his room, not wanting to talk to John about the true source of his anguish because it's really about John. A week later, Sherlock is writing sad music and not eating. He says it helps him think, and when John asks about what, he answers indirectly through his actions. You composing? Helps me to think. What are you thinking about? Count on your blog is still stuck at 1,895. He was thinking about how to get into the phone. Symbolically, he's trying to figure out his own heart, but he still can't because he's stuck in 1895, when all of these feelings had to go unspoken, shown by the blog counter also being stuck at 1895, and the screen literally telling us that Sherlock is 1895 locked. Filthy. Or oh, you've been hacked and it's a message. Hmm? John walks over to Mrs. Hudson and tries to get information about Sherlock's past experiences, which is yet another thing taken from the private life of Sherlock Holmes. I can get women from three continents to testify for me, and you can get women to vouch for you too, can't you, Holmes? Can you, Holmes? Good night, Watson. Holmes! Let me ask you a question. I hope I'm not being presumptuous, but, but there have been women in your life. The answer is yes. You're being presumptuous. Good night. Holmes! Here, though, he isn't concerned about public opinion. He wants to know for a much more personal reason. Listen, has he ever had any kind of uh, girlfriend, boyfriend, a relationship ever? I don't know. How can we not know? He's Sherlock. How will we ever know what goes on in that funny old head? John heads out and directs his energy at the first remotely available woman. Another thing taken from private life. Hello. Hello. So, any plans for New Year tonight? Uh, uh, nothing fixed. Nothing I couldn't heartlessly abandon. You have any ideas? One. 
You know, Mycroft could just phone me if he didn't have this bloody stupid power complex. It's in the Battersea power station scene that the power dynamic between Sherlock and Irene momentarily levels, and it's also a key point in Sherlock and John's relationship. Take Ben's commentary on the scene. You get everything of John's love, man love, not mm. love. any other guy. Let's love. call it Move. Um, <laughs> and it's, it's just, you know, it says everything about their relationship. It says what the bond is and the care is, and it's everything that they don't say to each other, but he's allowed to say, mm. thinking that he's not there. And that's where this is, as a romance, an incredibly British affair. There's an awful lot of beautifully understated mm. subtlety and nuance to it. Brassicans. Ask yourself as you're watching, what is the romance that he's talking about? Because it isn't with Irene. John is shown underestimating how much Sherlock cares about him when he arrives at the scene. Couldn't we just go to a cafe? Sherlock doesn't follow me everywhere. John walks into the room assuming that he's meeting with Mycroft and explains Sherlock's state. He's writing sad music. Doesn't eat, barely talks, only to correct the television. I'd say he was heartbroken, but, uh, well, he's Sherlock. He does all that anyway. He trails off at the end because he's shocked to see Irene, but he was just saying something very important. Sherlock acts heartbroken all the time anyway, and why would he be heartbroken since John has known him? John sees Irene, and even though he hates her and is extremely jealous of her, more than anything else, he really just wants Sherlock to be happy, so he tells her to go to him. Tell him you're alive. He'd come after me. I'll come after you if you don't. Mm, I believe you. I believe him too. He'd do anything for Sherlock. After a few seconds of Irene, John's frustration starts coming through, though. You were dead on a slab. It's definitely you. DNA tests are only as good as the records you keep. I know about you know the record keeper. I know what he likes, and I needed to disappear. Then how come I can see you? I don't even want to. Irene makes a big mistake and tries to get John to plan with her behind Sherlock's back. Look, I made a mistake. I sent something to Sherlock for safekeeping, and now I need it back, so I need your help. No. Nope. It's for his own safety. So is this. Tell him you're alive. I can't. Fine. I'll tell him. And I still won't help you. Of course he refuses without a second thought. But everything else she says here is to help her achieve that goal. Remember, she thinks she's outsmarted Sherlock and doesn't know he's there. She starts playing along, trying to get John to an emotional enough place that he'll empathize with her and possibly help her. To do that, she has to break through his jealousy and get to the pain he feels at being unwanted by Sherlock. What do I say? What do you normally say? You've texted him a lot. Just the usual stuff. There is no usual in this case. Good morning. I like your funny hat. I'm sad tonight. Let's have dinner. Mm, you look sexy on Crime Watch. Let's have dinner. I'm not hungry. Let's have dinner. You flirted with Sherlock Holmes. At him. He never replies. Now, Sherlock always replies to everything. He's Mr. Punchline. He will outlive God trying to have the last word. Look at the amazing leap in logic that John takes here. Does that make me special? I don't know, maybe. Sherlock always talks to him and never talks to Irene. So that must mean that Sherlock loves Irene. How does that make sense to anyone? <laughs> Irene cuts straight to the point and asks if John is jealous. He tries to avoid the question like he usually does, but Irene doesn't let him. Watch his reaction. You jealous? We're not a couple. Yes, you are. He also reacts badly to Irene's next text. There. Uh, I'm not dead. Let's have dinner. He doesn't want Irene to know how he feels because he hates her so much. And so he continues to be defensive. Notice his wording, though. He doesn't say he doesn't like Sherlock. He doesn't say he's straight. He tells the truth. Uh, who, who the hell knows about Sherlock Holmes? But for the record, if anyone out there still cares, I'm not actually gay. Irene cuts right through that, too, by telling a half-truth to get John on her side. She says she's gay and attracted to Sherlock. She equates their feelings, again, for John's benefit to get him on her side, and John says nothing. I'm not actually gay. Well, I am. Look at us both. 
his silence and his face scream the truth of her words. Irene was this close to actually getting John to hear her out, but they both underestimated Sherlock's feelings for John. He had actually followed him there. So Sherlock overheard the entire thing. If he were really grieving over Irene, he could have just come out and talked to her, and he would have known she was alive from the second he arrived. But he stayed in the shadows and listened, and he heard everything that John said, and more importantly, what he didn't say, that he didn't deny that he was in love with Sherlock. And it's only when he's discovered and he knows that John will come confront him about what he's just heard that he leaves. He was perfectly calm knowing that Irene was alive after all, but the knowledge that John returns his feelings is too much. He runs away. John tries to go after him, to explain, to apologize if he has to, to reassure Sherlock that he wouldn't do anything if that's not what Sherlock wants, but Irene stops him from going forward. I don't think so. Do you? Because if there's one thing she doesn't want, it's for the two of them to have an honest conversation. That will ruin everything that she and Moriarty are working for. John looks devastated, but it's not just him. It's clear from the next scene of Sherlock going home that what he just heard really affected him. Again, this isn't the shock of Irene being alive. It's the realization that John returns his feelings, that he could act on his desires and they would be together, but that he can't because Moriarty would destroy both of them. He's a wreck. But when he gets home, he discovers that Mrs. Hudson is in danger, and so he has to push all of that aside. But Sherlock is always at his most dangerous when he's emotionally vulnerable, because there's nothing he wouldn't do to protect the ones he loves. The Americans don't stand a chance. After Sherlock walks in, he approaches Mrs. Hudson to take her pulse because she's very afraid and he wants to make sure she's okay. I believe you have something that we want, Mr. Holmes. Then why don't you ask for it? <laughs> I've been asking this one. She doesn't seem to know anything. Her pulse is racing from fear here. Keep that in mind. Sherlock easily outsmarts and overpowers the agents and consoles Mrs. Hudson before tying up the American. I'm unarmed. Mind if I check? Oh, I insist. <laughs> Moron. Oh, you. All right, now. All right. John, who is certainly avoiding coming home considering how long it took him to get there, arrives at Baker Street to find Sherlock holding the American at gunpoint. What's going on? Jeez, what the hell is happening? Mrs. Hudson's been attacked by an American. I'm restoring balance to the universe. Oh, Mrs. Hudson, my God, are you all right? Jesus, what have I done to you? He takes Mrs. Hudson downstairs to take care of her, but not before Rage smiling at the agent because he knows he's going to pay for this. You're gonna tell me what's going on? I expect so, now go. Sherlock takes care of the agent, and after Lestrade arrests him, he heads into Mrs. Hudson's kitchen. As usual, he pretends to be indifferent about the situation at first, but then he shows Mrs. Hudson some affection and it completely melts John's heart. We need to look after her. Of no. course, but she's fine. No, she's not. Look at her. She's got to take some time away from Baker Street. She can go and stay with her sister. Doctor's orders. That'd be absurd. She's in shock, for God's sake, and all over some bloody stupid camera phone. Where is it, anyway? Safest place I know. You left it in the pocket of your second best dressing gown, you clot. <laughs> I managed to sneak it out when they thought I was having a cry. <laughs> Thank you. Shame on you, John Watson. Shame on me. Mrs. Hudson, leave Baker Street. England would fall. <laughs> Please, dear God, let that be the last time I have to look at that. Upstairs, John pours himself a drink and tries to start a conversation with Sherlock about what he overheard, about where they stand. He starts by asking about Irene's phone, which is again Sherlock's heart. Where is it now? Where no one will look. He takes a moment to steal himself, and then goes all in. So she's alive then. 
how are we feeling about that? Sherlock can't even make eye contact with John during this. He just can't. So he stares out the window hoping John will give up. Happy New Year, John. John presses a bit, but when it's clear that Sherlock doesn't want to talk, he sits down with his drink. Sherlock does look at him briefly, because he's playing for him to apologize, because they have to wait until Moriarty is gone, and until then, John can't know. Do you think you'll be seeing her again? It's only at this point, when Sherlock overheard John telling Irene that him not responding might be a sign of his attraction to her, that Sherlock finally texts Irene, trying to put that thought out of her mind. She takes it as a sign of victory. next scene, Sherlock is in the lab trying to break into Irene's phone, and Molly tries to start the same conversation that John did for the same reasons. Is that a phone? It's a camera phone. And you're x-raying it? Yes, I am. Whose phone is it? A woman's. Your girlfriend. Sherlock shows he's perplexed at the way straight people view love, and refers to them as another. You think she's my girlfriend because I'm x-raying her possessions? Well, we all do silly things. Yes. They do, don't they? Very silly. Now, though, when he thinks of romance, he thinks of home. She sent this to my address. She loves to play games. More months pass, and Sherlock comes home and smells Irene's perfume. He finds her laying in his bed. Guess where this came from? Holmes! She's gone! Well, I never. The shop. We have a client. What, in your bedroom? Oh. The same goes for Irene wearing Sherlock's robe. Madame Valadon, somebody tried to kill you last night. Do you have any idea who could have done it? I don't understand any of it. Oh, what does it all mean, Mr. Holmes? So who's after you? People who want to kill me. Who's that? Killers? Moriarty must have been protecting Irene these last few months that she was going without her phone. Now it's time to launch their plan and Irene needs her phone back. She's on the alert as soon as she sees it. Thank you. So, why don't I have So... What do you keep on here? Irene asks Sherlock to give her back her phone, which is also his heart, and John sadly glances at Sherlock to gauge his reaction. But I don't understand it. I assumed. Show me. Passcode. Sherlock tries to trick Irene with a double of the phone, but it doesn't work. Sherlock admires how well she has protected herself. It's not working. No, because it's a duplicate that I had made into which you've just entered the numbers 1058. I assumed you'd choose something more specific than that, but um, thanks anyway. I told you that camera phone was my life. I know when it's in my hand. Oh, you're rather good. You're not so bad. Hamish. John Hamish Watson. Just if you were looking for baby names. John is clearly still jealous. We've learned since then that not only does John hate his middle name, but that John knows that Sherlock was obsessed for months with discovering what it was. He's subtly trying to remind Sherlock of that here, and offers Irene the middle name that he hates. Sherlock is confused by John's assumption to say the least. Irene gives Sherlock the phone back with a puzzle. It's a bit small on that screen, can you read it? Yes. Code, obviously. I had one of the best cryptographers in the country take a look at it, though he was mostly upside down, as I recall. Couldn't figure it out. What can you do, Mr. Holmes? Go on. Press a go. He's already working on solving it before she stops speaking, and he's worked it out before either Irene can plant a kiss on his cheek or John can finish jealously slamming down his tea. Keep 
in mind that Irene tells Sherlock to impress her, but instead when he works it out he looks straight at John, who does look impressed, and jealous. There's a margin for error, but I'm pretty sure this is 7.47, leaving Heathrow tomorrow at 6.30 in the evening for Baltimore. Apparently it's going to save the world. Not sure how that could be true, but give me a moment. Do we know the case for eight seconds? Throughout the deduction, Sherlock only looks at and shows the phone to John, and only barely glances in Irene's general direction. It's very clear when you're paying attention where his interests truly lie. Oh, come on, it's not code. These are seat allocations on a passenger jet. Look, there's no letter I because it can be mistaken for a one. No letters past K. The width of the plane is the limit. The numbers always appear randomly and not in sequence. But the letters have little runs of sequence all over the place. Families and couples sitting together. Only a jumbo is wide enough to need a letter K all rows past 55, which is why there's always an upstairs. There's a row 13, which eliminates the more superstitious airlines. Then there's a the style of the flight number 007 that eliminates a few more. And assuming a British point of origin, which would be logical considering the original source of the information and assuming from the increased pressure on you lately that the crisis is imminent, the only flight that matches all the criteria and departs within the week is the 6.30 to Baltimore tomorrow evening from Heathrow Airport. When he's finished, he gives the phone back to Irene and tells her not to bother complimenting him, because John is already there to take care of his emotional needs in every way. Well, not in every every way, just yet, and Irene knows it. This scene is much better if you think Sherlock is overwhelmed imagining John saying this to him. Please don't feel obliged to tell me that was remarkable or amazing. John's expressed that thought in every possible variant available to the English language. I would have you right here on this desk until you begged for mercy twice. John, please can you check those flight schedules, see if I'm right? Yeah. I'm right, yeah. <clears throat> Poor John. He loves you, you idiot. John finds the flight, and because of John's phrasing, and because John had Sherlock watch Bond movies with him, which we know from John's blog, Sherlock finally starts piecing together the bigger puzzle. Uh, yeah, you're right. Uh, flight 007. What did you say? You're right. No, 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 after that. What did you say after that? 007. Flight 007. 007. The plan taking its name from the story is another T-plosh nod. What does the good book say? And Jonah lived in the belly of that fish for three days and three nights. As is Irene secretly sending signals while John and Sherlock aren't paying attention. Here it is. Thank you. We also see here that Jim Moriarty is in direct contact with Mycroft, which is suspicious to say the least. Mycroft is upset not only because his plan is ruined, but because he thinks he's indirectly broken his brother's heart. We cut back to Baker Street where Sherlock is playing the song he associates with this puzzle. As always, when he comes to, his first thought is of John. Coventry. I've never been. Is it nice? Where's John? He went out a couple of hours ago. I was just talking to him. He said you do that. Okay, so John directly told Irene that Sherlock talks to him while he's not there, before jealously storming off to leave the two of them alone. I would have loved to see how that conversation went. Sherlock has made the connection between the plane and an older case, and Irene takes this final opportunity to make Sherlock's upcoming defeat as unexpected as possible. If she can't trick Sherlock, she'll lose everything. Because if she isn't useful to Moriarty, in the best case scenario he'll abandon her, and in the worst case scenario he'll follow up on his threat to turn her into shoes. Everything depends on this plan. It's a story. Probably not true. In the Second World War, the Allies knew that Coventry was going to get bombed because they'd broken the German code, but they didn't want the Germans to know that they'd broken the code, so they let it happen anyway. Have you ever had anyone? Sorry. And when I say had, I'm being indelicate. I don't understand. I'll be delicate then. Let's have dinner. Why? You might be hungry. I'm not. Good. Why would I 
want to have dinner if I wasn't hungry. Sherlock coldly going along with physical contact to gain information is another thing taken from private life. Oh, hold me, hold me tight. It's been such a long time, so many nights. Do you know what I did before I left Bruxelles? Oh. I hope you're not going to be angry with me. I bought myself an expensive necklace. Come, my love. Come, come here. And the information he's getting here is her pulse. Now remember, why was Mrs. Hudson's pulse racing earlier? Arousal? No. Fear. Most elevated emotions have the same symptoms, and Sherlock confuses them, but they included the pulse scene earlier so we would know why Irene's pulse was elevated here. She's afraid. Also, we know from the abominable bride that Sherlock has the self-recognized tendency to misread things like this. Sherlock is called away in the middle of the night to meet with Mycroft, which, surprise, was also in private life. Come in. Mr. Ashdown, I have a bottle of champagne for you. A bottle of champagne? I didn't order it. No, indeed. You are to deliver it. Those are my instructions. Instructions from whom? Deliver it where? I wouldn't know, sir. But there's a carriage waiting for you downstairs. Are you sure you've got the right Mr. Ashdown? Quite sure, Mr. Holmes. Sherlock, this man was at the door. Is the bell still not working? He shot it. Have you come to take me away again? Yes, Mr. Holmes. Well, I decline. I don't think you do. For that reason, Sherlock's line in the car is particularly entertaining. The wheel turns, nothing is ever new. Yeah, I know. You stole this whole thing from another gay movie. Thanks for drawing attention to it. In the plane, Mycroft explains to Sherlock how all the pieces fit together. Speaking about things floating in the lake, how much do you know or think you know? I think you're testing some sort of underwater craft, camouflage to mislead the gullible. I think it's an experimental model operated by a crew of midgets. I think it is powered by sulfuric acid batteries and uses canaries to detect escaping gas. The Coventry conundrum. What do you think of my solution? The flight of the dead. Plane blows up midair. Mission accomplished for the terrorists. Hundreds of casualties, but nobody dies. Neat, don't you think? You've been stumbling around the fringes of this one for ages. Or were you too bored to notice the pattern? They wouldn't let her see Grandad when he was dead. She's not my real aunt. I know, human ash. He particularly mentions pulling a similar operation on the Germans. We ran a similar project with the Germans a while back, though I believe one of our passengers didn't make the flight. Guess which movie had Mycroft and Sherlock taking down German spies? Your client isn't Madame Valadon. It's the Imperial German government. This version is more direct with the fact that Sherlock's failure to see through Irene could be read as romantic. The woman who was brought to your house in the middle of the night, apparently fished out of the Thames, and apparently suffering from amnesia, is in fact Ilsa von Hoffmannsthal, one of their most skillful agents. Am I going too fast for the best brain in England? Go on. They planted her on you quite neatly, I must admit, so that you could lead them to their objective, the air pump. Very much like using a hog to find truffles. That's all it takes. One lonely, naive man desperate to show off, and a woman clever enough to make him feel special. You need to screen your defense people more carefully. I'm not talking about the MOD man, Sherlock. I'm talking about you. A damsel in distress. In the end, are you really so obvious? Because this was textbook. The promise of love, the pain of loss, the joy of redemption. Then give him a puzzle and watch him dance. And yet Sherlock himself dismisses the possibility. That'd be absurd. Mycroft apologizes to Sherlock for what he's done. Absurd. How quickly did you decipher that email for her? 
Was it the full minute? Or were you really eager to impress? I think it was less than five seconds. I drove you into her path. I'm sorry. I didn't know. What was it that he didn't know? Not that Sherlock has feelings. He's constantly trying to protect him. He thinks Sherlock fell for Irene and is surprised because he thought he knew Sherlock was gay. He was right about that. Now that Irene has almost accomplished her goal, she focuses on her prize and doesn't pay any attention to Sherlock. Mr. Holmes, I think we need to talk. So do I. There are a number of aspects I'm still not quite clear on. Not you, Junior. You're done now. Ask yourself if she would throw him aside so she could profit if she loved him so much that he was literally the key to her heart. The answer is no. Everything starts to come full circle here. Sherlock appears to have lost everything here, just as Irene did earlier in her home. But just as all hope seems lost, Sherlock will turn it around. But it's another point taken from private life, when Sherlock manages to help Mycroft take down the German spies. Well, Mycroft, it seems we have both been undone by a woman. What a shame, all that superb engineering and all that cunning espionage for naught. Not necessarily. If the Germans want that submersible so badly, why don't we give it to them? Give it to them? Invite them aboard for the final journey, 700 feet, straight down. And how are you going to arrange that? I'm rather counting on you to do it since you're on such intimate terms with Fräulein von Hoffmannsthal. But for now, it appears that Irene has won. She's being extremely flirtatious because, again, that's how she exercises her control. Sherlock, dear, tell him what you found when you x-rayed my camera phone. There are four additional units wired inside the casing. I suspect containing acid or a small amount of explosive, any attempt to open the casing will burn the hard drive. Explosive? It's more me. He's good, isn't he? I should have him on a leash. In fact, I might. She explicitly states that she's done with all the games now. She just wants her prize, comfort, and safety. Unless there are lives of British citizens, depending on the information you're about to burn. Are there? Telling you would be playing fair. I'm not playing anymore. She's still preoccupied with her protection. Even now, she's still afraid. A list of my requests and some ideas about my protection once they're granted. My cross begrudging compliment of Irene's handiwork is yet another line taken from private life. Frankly, I think we're making a very poor deal. You're much better than most operatives working for British intelligence. I wish our lot were half as good as you. It's at this point that Irene reveals that she isn't actually as smart as she appears to be. She only managed to get this far with Moriarty's help. I can't take all the credit. Had a bit of help. Oh, Jim Moriarty sends his love. It's when Irene mentions Moriarty and his love that Sherlock finally starts to figure out the passcode. Irene mentions that Moriarty's nickname for Sherlock is the Virgin. Gave me a lot of advice about how to play the Holmes boys. You know what he calls you? The Iceman. And the Virgin. And says that she admires Moriarty. Didn't even ask for anything. I think he just likes to cause trouble. Now that's my kind of man. But here you are. The dominatrix who brought a nation to its knees. This is where she loses everything. As I explained earlier, Irene chose her password because she knew that the last thing Sherlock would suspect was that he was the key to everything. Sherlock follows a similar logic path to get to the answer, but with the wrong motivation. Sherlock thinks that Irene, like Moriarty, is in love with him. Well, for Moriarty it's more obsession than love. And thinks that this whole thing is similar to a game that Moriarty would play. In the last episode, Sherlock made the mistake of assuming that the game was about the missile plans when it was really about him, and he doesn't want to make that mistake again. He thinks that Irene was counting on the fact that because of his inexperience, he wouldn't recognize attraction. He thinks she believes that it's the last thing he would guess. He's right about that very last part, at least, and that's enough for him to get to the passcode. Sherlock starts his deduction, and Irene's initial reaction is genuine. She thinks she's well and truly tricked Sherlock. I said no. Very, very close, but no. You got carried away. The game was too elaborate. You're enjoying yourself too much. No such thing as too much. Oh, enjoying the thrill of the chase is fine. Craving the distraction of the game, I sympathize entirely, but sentiment. Sentiment is a chemical defect found in the losing side. Sentiment? What are you talking about? You. Oh, dear God. Look at the poor man. You don't actually think I was interested in you. Why? Because you're the great Sherlock Holmes, the clever detective in the funny hat. As soon as Sherlock mentions her pulse, though, Irene knows that Sherlock has the passcode. No. Because 
I took your pulse. What's happening to Irene here is everything that Sherlock is afraid of for himself, and that slips through. Why else would he bring up John here? I imagine John Watson thinks love's a mystery to me, but the chemistry is incredibly simple and very destructive. That line makes it clear that Sherlock is talking just as much about himself as he is Irene here, so listen to the rest of his speech with that in mind. When we first met, you told me that disguise is always a self-portrait. How true of you, the combination to your safe, your measurements, but this, this is far more intimate. This is your heart, and you should never let it rule your head. You could have chosen any random number and walked out of here today with everything you've worked for. But you just couldn't resist it, could you? I've always assumed that love is a dangerous disadvantage. Thank you for the final proof. Irene knows that Sherlock will break into the phone, but tries to have an honest moment with him to start gaining sympathy. She's already working on backup plans for protection because that's how her mind works. So she tells the truth, that none of what she did was real, but Sherlock doesn't pick up on the full meaning. Everything I said, it's not real. I was just playing the game. I know. And this is just losing. Sherlock gives Mycroft the phone, and at this point Irene has lost all of her power. She does the last thing you'd expect from her. She begs. She desperately needs Sherlock to feel bad for her so he'll save her. They are, brother. Hope the contents make up for any inconvenience I may have caused you tonight. I'm certain they will. If you're feeling kind, lock her up. Otherwise, let her go. I doubt she'll survive long without her protection. Are you expecting me to beg? Yes. Please. At this point, though, it doesn't work. Sherlock walks away. You're right. It won't even last six months. Sorry about dinner. This is a change from T-Plosh, where Holmes initially saves Ilsa, only to have her die later. You're going back to Germany. Germany? You will be conducted to the Swiss-German border and be exchanged for one of our agents, a man named Ibbotson. Thank you. Oh, don't thank me. Thank my brother. It was his idea. Here, the order is reversed. And looking back, when Sherlock and Irene met, Sherlock was fake crying to get sympathy, he nearly won but lost, and he helplessly listened to Irene's deductions while she tampered with his phone. In this next-to-last meeting, Sherlock appears to lose, then wins. Irene has to helplessly listen as Sherlock deduces her and breaks into her phone, and Irene starts crying to gain sympathy. There's only one thing left before this arc can resolve, one last debt to be repaid. Months pass again. I think most of the time that Sherlock and John knew each other before the fall took place in this episode. Mycroft is waiting for John outside of Speedy. You don't smoke? I also don't frequent cafes. Instead of John finding out about Irene's death through a letter to Sherlock, as happened in Teeplosh, Here, Mycroft gives John the information directly, and he is the one who must decide what to do with it. Mycroft does this because he's trying to help John understand that Sherlock does care, because he knows that he can trust John to protect his brother's heart. He's clearly biting something back when John cluelessly states that Sherlock isn't capable of being sentimental. He's not like that. He doesn't feel things that way, I don't think. He tries to help John reach the truth. My brother has the brain of a scientist or a philosopher, yet he elects to be a detective. What might we deduce about his heart? I don't know. Neither do I. But initially, he wanted to be a pirate. Mycroft gives John the information about Irene, and gives John the choice of how to handle it, because again, he trusts John to handle Sherlock's heart. He'll be okay with this witness protection, never seeing her again. He'll be fine. I agree. That's why I decided to tell him that. Instead of what? She's dead. She was captured by a terrorist cell in Karachi two months ago and beheaded. So.
Upstairs, it's clear that John still hasn't made up his mind about what he's going to tell Sherlock. Not until he's already started saying it. It's about Irene Adler. Well, something happened? Did she come back? No, no. She's, uh, I just bumped into Mycroft downstairs. He had to take a call. Is she back in London? No. She's, uh... In America. When Sherlock asks why he would want to see Irene again, John is obviously relieved. Well, you know. I know what? Well, you won't be able to see her again. I would I want to see her again? Didn't say you did. Sherlock takes the news so well that John almost changes his mind and tells Sherlock the truth, but then Sherlock asks for the phone. Listen, actually... Oh, but I will have the camera phone, though. He knows John will do it, because he knows John would do anything that he asked. He understands that now. Sherlock, I have to give this to Mycroft. It's the government's now. I couldn't even Please. Thank you. Now that the phone is wiped of its contents, it no longer has any association with Irene's heart. It's a memento of the case, and of Sherlock's own heart. He wants to keep it to show John that he is capable of being sentimental, because he needs John to hold on for just a little while longer, just until he can bring Moriarty down. John asks Sherlock one last time if he ever heard anything from Irene. Did she ever text you again? After all that? Once, a few months ago. What she said? Goodbye, Mr. Holmes. John clearly thinks that Sherlock knows that Irene is dead and is shutting him out. The last thing Irene said to Sherlock was goodbye, another nod to private life. What you saying? Oh. Be the same. Irene's theme starts playing one last time as Sherlock walks to the window and looks through the text. I need to draw attention to the one Irene sent about John's blog, because out of the over 57 texts, we only see a few of them. And one of them is Irene telling Sherlock that John loves him more than she does. She knew all along. The episode looks like it will end the same way the private life of Sherlock Holmes did, with Sherlock broken up over his failure and never recovering, never coming out of hiding to tell John how he really feels. You're getting better. All the while, Irene's theme swells, but Moffat changed the ending. Sherlock was there to save her. Ah. Well, I say run. Run. He finally restores balance by saving Irene's life the way she saved his at the start of the episode. And he doesn't have to regret revealing her and shutting her out. He can remember this case happily, after all of this and whatever happened in Karachi. And you can look in the description below to find Moffat's take on what really happened. He knows they're the same. And without her, he wouldn't have realized John's feelings. And so she matters to him. He calls her by her professional title, a sign of respect. He puts the phone in a drawer, closes it, and walks away. The woman.
even pointed out in the commentary that this is the first and only time we hear Irene's theme resolved, and he also lets it slip why he chose this ending. You know, unlike in Private Life, which I love so much, but you know, it's a very sad memory for Sherlock. Yeah. In this version, actually, he's always just going to love thinking about this. Absolutely. Oh, and another that amazing <laughs> woman. Yeah. Was the last one. And of course, here's another this cousin usually thing. Because people always wonder, is it the woman or the woman? Mm. It's both. Yes. <laughs> I love the way you play this. Mm. It's beautiful. I also love the way the music comes in. You hear yeah. one last bit mm. of, uh, of Mara's theme, and finally it resolves. Mm. You never hear it end before, and mm. it's sort of sad because <coughs> it's. But and also, that's it, that's rather, rather beautifully, he, he closes the draw. And that's, he closes the episode. It's it's, yeah, mm. I mean. But that's it over. He's not. He's, he doesn't think about it. Again. Well, he does think about it sometimes, but you know. Back to work, back, back to, to being Sherlock Holmes. Back not. to the adventures. And so the events of this episode don't have to haunt Sherlock. He can happily look back on this case, but he can also put it behind him. And life in Baker Street, the careful balancing act that could be thrown off with a single mistake, goes on. And unlike in the private life of Sherlock Holmes, in this version, one day Sherlock and John will be given their happy ending. I'm sure you'll all understand why I put a lot of emphasis on this episode. If you stuck all the way through to the end, thank you very much. I'd also like to thank Stacy for helping me with this script. It was kind of a behemoth. I'd also like to thank Teapot Subtext and Kinklock for letting me reference their posts. As always, links to everything I've referenced can be found in the description below. Next week, I'll be talking about the symbolism of Sherlock's Deerstalker. The week after that, I have grad school finals, so I'll be taking the week off from video making. I hope you all understand. But after that, I'll be back with more videos and a tentative schedule for the next few months. So be looking forward to all of that coming out soon. And until then, get ready to believe. And I really hope that this episode made it a lot easier for you to believe.